television has seen many a fine presenter, producer and interviewer, but rarely does one person have it all. Sir David Frost was one such person, a pioneer who changed the nature of broadcasting. Good evening. Good evening. David changed British television. He understood what people cared about in terms of current affairs, but also what made people laugh. The rule here is don't, but if you must, confess as soon as possible afterwards. <laughs> David was really the person who defined the interview where the interviewer doesn't try to become the story, he tries to extract the story. One thing you always knew about David was that his lifeblood was appearing on television. I think David was motivated by insatiable curiosity. Everything he saw interested him. He did it all with a, with a minimum of ego, as well as becoming the only British interviewer to actually take America. He was involved in so many different revolutions, the revolution of British satire, uh, the revolution of the uh, commercialization of television in the UK and breakfast TV, and then actually revolutionizing what political interviews really meant. What made the man who took on a president, whose career encompassed politics, satire, and entertainment? People. People made him happy, his friends, his family, and then he'd interview you and he'd be happy to talk to you. He was at the top of his game in the public eye for 50 years. You know, he was unique, he was a one-off. You know, and that was our dad. David Frost was catapulted to fame as the host of the BBC's That Was The Week That Was in 1962. It was a smash hit. He was 23 years old. Ahead of him lay a spectacular career in television. Hello, good evening and welcome. And I think you say things and I say things that people are, want to hear, that they're thinking about but haven't expressed. Let's welcome now, please, Mr. John Lennon and Miss Yoko Ono. What does 69.5 kilohertz mean? Well, what does 69.4 carats really mean? It can't be dismissed as an idle bauble. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Muhammad Ali. So far, after one session, all the omens are good. The David Frost Show. David's ongoing career left the rest of us gasping because it was so consistent, so persistent, so dogged, but such, such quality. He was the only person to interview seven consecutive US presidents and a total of eight British prime ministers. He let us see people like Nelson Mandela, Tony Blair, endless American presidents with a kind of clarity and a directness and a freshness. We would never otherwise have seen them and he understood the power and appeal of all forms of television. He defied uh, description, David, because there'd never been anybody like him before. He did all these different things. He reinvented himself almost every week and was hugely successful. But where did this success begin? He was born in Kent, on the 7th of April, 1939, to the Reverend Wilfred J. Paradine Frost and Mona, who had two daughters aged 14 and 16. So, having sold the pram and everything, as his mother put it, David Paradine Frost was a late but welcome addition. His father instilled a Methodist work ethic, which he would hand down to his three sons. I think very much from the Methodist upbringing, um, there were three main points. Um, the first one was to always contribute. Um, the second one was to always use the talent that you've been given. And the third one, which I think is, you know, every single one of us can take on, is never waste a second of your life and always make sure that whatever you're doing, there's not something better that you can be doing. 
he was obviously incredibly intelligent, but he worked incredibly hard. And it's something he's always told us is you've got to do what you love because you can't work that hard at something you don't love. People say, ah, very puritanical, very puritan, very Methodist, you know, and that I think was a positive influence on me, that, that's, that side of Methodism, you know. It was a loving childhood, which David described as relatively sheltered, sheltered from Sunday newspapers and alcohol by my parents' principals, from meals in restaurants, overseas trips and aeroplanes by my parents' budget. But it gave David his unerring optimism. He had a pretty strong mum, Mona. I remember him saying, he said, dads do their bit, but mothers really do it. I think he got his confidence from her. She was just the same. She found into a room, beaming, full of energy. And that's how, that's how David was. One of the things that David wanted was success and the things that came with it. I think he wanted a glittering lifestyle and he set out to get it and he got it. Before finding that success in television, David Frost's life could have been very different. As a boy, he'd been tempted by a career in sport. I mean, he was always very proud of the fact that, that he'd been offered professional terms as a goalkeeper by Nottingham Forest. I met his elder sisters, I'd certainly one of them, and assorted nephews, nieces, cousins, and they all told you, oh, yes, he could have been a footballer, you know, could have left this world behind. He probably made the correct decision in that it's unlikely he would have been at the top of uh, his game for 50 years like he was for television. Uh, and he also likened the fact um, that at, at that stage there was a maximum wage you could take in football uh, of £25 a week, I think he said it was. So, uh, yeah, he, he liked to retell it, but only when prompted. And I think, you know, he was proud that he, he probably made the right decision. We've come here to help lead you in a crusade to win men to Jesus Christ and to help promote the kingdom of God in Britain. He also took training as a Methodist lay preacher. It wasn't due to his father's influence alone. As a 15-year-old, David saw the American evangelist Billy Graham, describing it not so much as a Damascus experience, but a Harringay one. The power of the performance remained, as did his faith. I heard at the funeral that he knelt down by his bed every night and prayed and that kind of came as a little bit of a, a shock to me but we did talk about religion he, def he definitely did have a, a faith david was somebody who definitely had a set of very clear moral principles and precepts about how he should live his life of all the friends i've had he was the one who had i think the tightest grip on a belief um journalists tend to not bother about those sort of things and uh, he believed it. I mean, he was brilliant, my father. He had never given me a hint of the fact that he prayed every day that I would go into the Methodist church and the Methodist ministry. And he never wanted to lay that on me, as it were, but he prayed about it, and I only learnt, learnt about it after he died. But the young David had set his heart on going to Cambridge University. The interview was the first time he had spent a night away from his parents. The second time was when he won his place to study English. He soon revealed a natural confidence. By the time I went round the society's fair at the beginning of term, I, was, I knew I'd like to run that at Footlights and Eric Granter and so on. So I had my ambitions there, and of course, it was an amazing place because of the talent there. I mean, there were the P Peter Cook, uh, a year ahead of me, John Cleese a couple of years behind me, all of the goodies. He succeeded in becoming editor of the university arts magazine Granter and secretary of the comedy society Footlights. David was virtually sort of stage manager and everything and Peter said to me once, we didn't want him in sketches, he was terrible. <laughs> but he was a good organiser of course. And they had their second hand dinner jackets or something and they drove to the Palace Theatre Westcliff, Cambridge Footlights, to do, you know, a show. And Peter said, we got out of the van, and there was a poster. David Frost presents Cambridge Footlights. He'd been to the printers. This was the beginning of a rivalry between the satirist Peter Cook and David.
I knew the Beyond the Fringe people, Alan Bennett, Jonathan Miller, Dudley Moore and Peter Cook. Um, they did feel that David copied um, a lot of their work and a lot of their ideas. I mean, he took the Im idea of impersonating public figures. They had done lampoons of Harold Macmillan and so on. So they were the real... Um, breakers of convention, but they did it in the theatre. He did it on television. That was the big difference. In his second year at university, the Footlights were asked to produce an item for regional television. While I was at Cambridge, I started doing things for Anglia television and so on, which uh, I think my father originally thought was Anglican television. He thought it was another <laughs> branch of the church. <laughs> Stepping into a TV studio for the first time was a revelation for David Frost. I just felt getting into television, I just, this is home. You know, I really did, it was an extraordinary feeling. He honed his performance skills, working the comedy circuit while pursuing a career as a reporter with Anglia Television. Well, I see from this that the 8.30 from Liverpool Street arrives at 11.11, but it doesn't. It's running later and there's not even a special announcement to tell the public about it. What do they think? Anglia thought that David Frost wasn't cut out for television. However, after graduating in 1961, he was taken on as a trainee by Associated Rediffusion, where he struck a chord with two actors. I was sharing a flat with Terence Stamp, and he made a film called Billy Budd and, and became sort of famous, and not me. But uh, uh, he had to do TV interviews, and, and I used to go along and sponge, you know, get a couple of drinks and just have an evening out, you know, and see people. And when you go to these things, you're always met by someone who sh takes, meets your car and then takes you, shows you a dressing room, gets you some coffee and stuff like that. And this young guy did all this, but he was so impressive. And as we were getting in the car, I said, what's your name? And he said, David Frost. And we got in the car and drove away. And Terry Stamp and I both turned to each other at the same time and said, I think we're going to hear of that guy again. But as a sort of joke, because his personality was extraordinary. David secured himself an agent, Noel Gay Artists, whom he would stick with throughout his career. They soon had reason to celebrate. It seems wrote his agent, that we have a very big property in David Frost. Indeed, he'd finally arrived. Good evening, good evening. An odd week for political... David was a completely different unit from us. We were all learning sketches, singing songs, doing bits and pieces. He was put, he kept the whole thing together. A peaceful Sunday afternoon, the Salvation Army band. <laughs> Any live program, things go wrong. So instead of us coming to a dreadful stop and not knowing what to do, you just cut to David. I wonder why in all the rehearsals you refused to do that last link, actually. <laughs> now we know. And that takes real nerve, that takes real nerve. Not getting, not getting put out by that at all. The speed of David's rise was quite extraordinary. One minute, nobody had ever heard of him, and the next minute, everybody had. Age of 23, not just being a TV star, but one of very few TV stars, so he was very much in the spotlight. It's, it's astonishing, really, to think of now. But certainly the man of the moment, the man of last week and with the Labour Party conference, the man of next week, is Hugh Gatesville. Hugh Gatesville has in recent years established himself as the only possible leader of the Labour Party. I look at his colleagues and it's clear that they are not really capable of leading a cart horse. It's impossible to understand all these years later what an extraordinarily fresh and original program that was. In, in some ways, it was the beginning of the 60s. Next, please. Come along. Who's next? Ah, oh, uh, Mr. Henry Burke. <laughs> it was a mixture of jokes and comedy, scepticism, um, wit, and then ser serious, really serious, informed current affairs. And that was a, that was a perfect formula. It just shows if our Home Secretary wouldn't get away with murder. <laughs> no one was protected. The age of respect disappeared with TW3 and got replaced by something else. And, and things like politics were never the same again. They argued, they pleaded, they fought, and they bluffed, they couldn't agree. But they all got stuffed. 
and, and, and what we, we didn't know at the time that what was happening around us was the Cultural Revolution of that time. The pop revolution happened and George Best came into Manchester, the first glamorous footballer. So the epicentre of it for us was, 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 was Manchester. But when we looked outside, the only significant thing that we saw, and it wasn't fashion in Carnaby Street, was David doing that, that show, and that was terribly influential. <laughs> it certainly is, Connie. And why did you choose Wilson? Well, I, I thought that the other one was probably cleaner, but it wasn't so bright. From the very first show on, there were these enormous number of phone calls. Television press office. Why so many people wrote in uh, favourably was obviously because they were terrified this thing was about to be swept off the air. They'll never let it continue, they'll stop it, you know. All my friends, you know, the sort of guys, us 60s guys, we never missed that was a week that was. It was the best show on television. TW3, as it became known, was a hit. Viewing figures grew from three and a half to a peak of 12 million. But in 1963, it became a victim of its own success, pulled over fears it could affect the impending general election. But they didn't go quietly. The BBC announced this afternoon that the present series of Andy Pandy will end on December the 28th. It is felt that in an election year, the political content of this programme, which is one of its most successful ingredients, will be more and more difficult to maintain. A key part of TW3 was its power to respond to major news events. News has just come in that President Kennedy has been shot. With all the satires stripped away, the next day's TW3 devoted itself to the sorrow felt. The reason why the shock was so great, why when one heard the news last night one felt suddenly so empty, was because it was the most unexpected piece of news one could possibly imagine. It was the least likely thing to happen in the whole world. If anyone else had died, Sir Winston Churchill, de Gaulle, Khrushchev, would have been something that somehow we could have understood and even perhaps accepted. But that Kennedy should go, well, we just didn't believe in assassination anymore. Not in the civilized world, anyway. A young man rode with his head held high under the Texas sun. This programme caught the eye of NBC. So, as TW3 ended in the UK, another version opened in the USA with David, not as host, but as guest presenter. To those of you who wrote in that you hated our pilot show, where did you see this one? <laughs> and at the same time, he launched shows in Britain. The juggling of a transatlantic career had begun. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul McCartney. It became almost a joke that David would go to America sort of, you know, um, eight days a week. Obviously was extremely energised and stimulated by the American market. We used to call it his straight off the plane face. Morning all, colour of porridge and everything, and boy, clicked into action very quickly. Did, what sort of shtick did you do before you got together? Yeah. What's that, American? American, isn't it? Yes, yeah, certainly is. Eh? Certainly you is. got that a lot, do you? Yes, I do. It shows. Does yeah. it really? Yeah. Are you with us now, or are you on Concord? I know, I'm, I'm there. Eh? I'm there. I'd just oh. like to know how fast are we going? <laughs> By 1966, David fronted ITV and BBC shows simultaneously. Each week, The Frost Report, launched on the BBC, presented comedy sketches based around a single theme. Marty Feldman was working in a sort of editorial capacity as well as writing. I remember that the theme of the first, one of the first shows, was Holidays, suggested by Marty, who then disappeared on holiday. <laughs> the Frost Report brought together those who would go on to transform British comedy. Members of the future Monty Python team and the goodies cut their teeth here. And Ronnie first worked with Ronnie. Good morning, Super. Morning, wonderful. 
who was a very good sort of ringmaster, got around him a, a lot of very good people. So yes, he gave it a, a real sense of direction and excitement and the feeling that, you know, with this, with television, you could go anywhere. key point of my life, he was the turning point of my life, completely changed my life and my career. And I think it would be safe to say he did the same with Ronnie B. One of the most memorable sketches was a parody of the British class system. What we were all doing, or trying to do at the time, was break down the class barriers, which sounds sort of silly now, but it wasn't silly then. Indeed, there's one rich man in Chelsea who's so snobbish he won't even travel in the same car as his chauffeur. <laughs> and David did more with that show than anybody to do that. I get a feeling of superiority over them. I get a feeling of inferiority from him, but a feeling of superiority over him. I get a pain in the back of my neck. The moment class is mentioned in this country, that is a picture of John Cleese, Ronnie B and me. And it was a very clever little sketch at the time. La rose d'or de Montreux, à la majorité absolue, à l'œuvre présentée par la British Broadcasting Corporation Londres, France over England. <laughs> A special edition of the Frost Report won the 1967 Golden Rose of Montreux. And as you must know by now, Frost over England has won the Golden Rose and the press prize. First of all, champagne, I think. Let's open a fresh bottle. When I managed in the evening, I remember to say thank you in all the languages represented there. Merci beaucoup, uh, arigato gozai, imas, grazie. Feel and dank, dookie fam, zen coin, bar, soca, stern him, say pen, etc., etc. I could do the whole, the whole lot, and uh, and that shows that I was quite confident that I'd bothered to nip out to the loo and learn that or whatever. His confidence also gave him the ability to unsettle his colleagues. If he was appearing live, which he loved, he would deliberately make himself a little bit late to get the adrenaline going three or four minutes before you were going to go on air, uh, David would be conducting a conversation with somebody um, on the other side of the Atlantic. And in those days, uh, United Nations, I mean, it was Boutros, Boutros, Gali. And this man rushes in and goes, David, David, come on. And uh, quite coolly, David says, Boutros, Boutros, always a pleasure, and walked into the studio. But behind this relaxed approach was a serious man. His show on ITV, The Frost Programme, revealed his unique style of interviewing. Good evening and thank you. And tonight it's my pleasure to welcome the Foreign Secretary, the Right Honourable George Brown. Welcome. And we must say how much we appreciate it, particularly in the week of the tragedy that befell West Ham at Swindon, which was a... Please. So the guest felt, well, this person is really at ease. Um, he doesn't seem particularly wound up or anxious or aggressive. So that puts me at ease too. What have you done today? What time did you get to bed, get up? He became people's friend, which is a clever interviewing technique because they let you in. I came home last night, got home from Brussels at 10.30 took about an hour to uh, get myself back on speaking terms with my wife. <laughs> and then <laughs> he could lull his interviewees because he was, he was such good company. And they'd relax, and he'd suddenly hit them with a very quiet question and think, gotcha. Welcome back with me now, Dr. Emil Savundra. This 1967 edition with fraudulent businessman Emil Savundra was controversial becoming known as the first trial by television. By him. Fire auto went bust, and a great many people have not had claims paid. Is that true? Tell you when you catch me. No, no. That question wasn't even intelligent. No. I'm not going to cross swords with the peasants. I came here to cross swords with England's greatest swordsman. 
I'm afraid nobody is a peasant. I'm afraid they're the people who gave you your money. Ah, this is fine. Uh, the Savonda intro was groundbreaking because, again, it moved television on. He actually got a real figure and, and, and put him under the cosh in front of a camera. Just a second. My husband was killed in a car crash. He was a passenger in January 65. And I was supposed to get £7,000. The claim was settled in April 65. And the cheque was held up for other excuses until June 65, when, of course, it bounced. The only thing I can say is this. All these and the other heart-rending stories, which I've heard recently, have made me realize only too well that my selling out was the wisest thing I ever did. For you? How? How do you mean that? By selling out, I have no legal responsibility and no moral responsibility. No moral you have, you have no total moral, moral responsibility I beg your for all you. these people. David attacked him from a high moral viewpoint. He didn't go in for the fact he was breaking the law. The essence of his attack was that this man was behaving immorally. Right. How do you sign a bit of paper yes. that gets rid of past moral responsibility? Tell me that. He doesn't sort of say you're the most evil man who ever walked the planet. He just keeps at him with the questions and kind of wears him down. You can look at these people yes. here, widows, widowers, whoever they are, yes. and you can feel I have no legal responsibility, right. and I've signed a piece of paper, and I have no moral responsibility right. either. Thank you. It really made people take him seriously in a way that before that uh, they hadn't been quite sure whether he was just a, a comic or an entertainer. It's not really the way to end the series, but it's the end of the well done, series. Bye-bye. Well well <laughs> At the age of 27, he set up David Paradine Productions, still going strong today. Their first program featured the preacher he'd seen as a teenager, Billy Graham. It's like a door. Here's a door, and over that door it says, whosoever will, let him come. That includes you, me, everyone. Back in the days when everything was owned by ITV or the BBC, David was, was arguing about owning rights. So he was one of the first to set up an independent company and take control whereas we were always subject to the fashions and waywardness of television, David rooted himself in places where it was secure, in the business side of it, in contacts, in trading, in making um, alliances with people, with other departments, with other um, independent companies, with other franchises and so on. In 1967, he successfully spearheaded the bid to launch London Weekend Television. He pulled together a dazzling team of talents. And uh, it was not surprising that he, he won the licence, because in those days it was a beauty parade, it wasn't a bidding contest. And uh, sadly it didn't last, that team didn't last very long, but uh, uh, out of it came a very successful television network. By the 1970s, David Frost was everywhere, and his ability to handle the interview was renowned. David did one of the funniest and, and, and revealing interviews with Muhammad Ali. The Christian Bible says all white people are devils. Ah, well, the Christian Bible says all people oh, are no. sinful. It says all white Gentiles and Jews are devils. Now, it's it's Ali makes a mistake of quoting scripture to somebody who knew the Bible more than he did. Can you stop the show and let me go get my briefcase? <laughs> yes, sure. Yes, yeah. Can you stop the tape for a minute? No, we'll keep the tape running. So and let me go get so, my briefcase. So and get it in four hundredths of a second. All whites are devils. Right. Devil. All right. Right. right, well, he's just going to uh, prove to us that all white people are devils, so we'll keep the tape running. It's just a wonderful theatrical moment. Now, if you look at it, you think, he set that up, but he didn't, actually. He says here in Romans... Romans... Third chapter and the ninth verse. What then, <clears throat> it says, are we better than they? No in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. It was Ali who challenged him on, on a saying, 
a quotation, and David got it right. It says, all Jews and, and Gentiles. Gentiles. And in the Bible, mm -hmm. Gentiles means all people who are not Jews. Not just whites, no, but blacks, greens, blues, and everybody. Well, you teaching me something I don't know then. Well, I thought I should tell you that. Gentiles means everyone. Look, let oh, me put it in You shouldn't way. see it on TV. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite moments. Because Ali was a handful. I know that better than most. Despite the heated exchange, the two men remained on good terms for decades. When you look at the people that David interviewed, there, will, the, there never has been and never will be, I suspect, anybody who will have his span. In 1968, he had captured the last personal interview with Senator Robert F. Kennedy. Yes, how would you like to be remembered? I mean, uh, in what would you like the first line of a history book about Robert Kennedy to say? Now, I think something about the fact that he I made some contribution to uh, uh, either you know my country or uh, or those who were less well off. I think again back to uh, uh, what Camus wrote about the. F fact that uh, perhaps this world is a world in which children suffer, but we can lessen the number of suffering children. And if you do not do this, then who will do this? And I'd like to feel that I'd done something to lessen that suffering. Weeks later, the senator was assassinated. More than two decades on, David Frost would ask the difficult questions of Kennedy's convicted killer, Sirhan Sirhan. Did it not occur to you then or very soon after that the weak and the disadvantaged and the helpless were tremendously wounded by the loss of Robert Kennedy? I they agree. would be better off with, if he was still alive. I agree, sir. I can't say anything but... That, that except that I am totally sorry, sir. I can't feel but nothing but remorse to, for, for having caused that, that, that tragic death of Robert Kennedy. And if I could, sir, bring him back to life and talk to him and, and have him, you know, uh, carry out what he had, you know, promised to do to for the weak and the disadvantaged, that uh, I would treasure the opportunity to, to bring him back to life. And the sum total of all of those interviews that David has done are going to be a very, very important historical archive. And anybody who wants to understand the second part of the 20th century is going to have to look at those interviews. As president, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. The securing of that place in history came after President Nixon's surprise resignation in the wake of the political scandal known as Watergate. He had not given an account to the American people. He'd not been put on trial. He'd not been called before congressional uh, committees. He was going to have to answer a lot of tough questions. It took more than two years, but the man who persuaded the president was David Frost in 1977. There has always been a suspicion that Nixon said yes to David, not just because David offered him the biggest check, $600,000, which he did, but because he thought uh, David would be an easier uh, uh, interviewer. If you feel that he is stonewalling, or, from what you learned in your research, lying, what do you do? I shall say so, again and again and again. They thought he was an irrelevant entertainment presenter. And they'd obviously never seen the Savundra interview or those sort of hard interviews that David had done. I hope the approach he'd take will be the one of... A cascade of candor. A cascade of candor from Richard Nixon? Is this what you expect? No, it was just a phrase that I thought would appeal to you. 
David assumed that he would find it easy to fund and to sell the program. The American networks wouldn't buy it. Um, he, in the end, did attract some investors. He had to construct his own television network and he had to sell his own advertising whilst we were preparing this monumentally difficult journalistic uh, task. A lot of us, at the time of the Nixon interviews, the time he did them, thought uh, that David had probably lost the plot and had his best days. Because one has to remember how short most careers in the media, and especially in television, are. The Nixon interviews took place over 30 hours, with Watergate forming just four hours of the total time. Mr. President, to try and review your account of Watergate uh, in one program is a daunting task. We focused on those things where the evidence was strong. We ignored those areas of which there were many, where there was suspicion but no evidence. We made sure that we understood the legal framework. Uh, what would the, the charge sheet have said? And he studied Nixon. He studied Nixon's physical appearance, his body language, the rate he sweated, his hands, how he moved, how he was dressed, how he w related to those around him. David studied Nixon to the nth degree. Nixon had some of his former White House staffers. They prepared him very heavily for all the earlier interviews. We assumed, naturally, they prepared him heavily for the Watergate uh, in interviews. It transpired that he'd done no preparation at all. And you were recollecting this meeting, and you said that you said to Dean and to Holderman, Christ, turn over any cash we got. That's your recollection of the meeting on April yeah. the 20th when you didn't know you were on television. Of course I didn't know I was on television. On April the 20th, it could well have been my recollection. And so when the interview started, Nixon equivocated, he wondered, he talked on and on and on. We haven't followed up with what happened after the meeting. David simply out-argued him, both on the facts, uh, and he out-argued him on Nixon's legal interpretation. Talking about this hush money for Hunt, talking about blackmail mm -hmm. and all of that, I would say that you endorsed or ratified it. But let's leave that on one side I didn't for a minute. endorse or ratify Why didn't you stop it? Because at that point, I had nothing to no knowledge of the fact that it was going to be paid. He came up with some very old and unpersuasive uh, thoughts. Uh, and David quite quickly had him on the ropes. Would you go further than mistakes? The word that seems n not enough for people to understand. What word would you express? My goodness, that's a... I think that there are three things, since you asked me. I would like to hear you say, I think the American people would like to hear you say, one is... There was probably more than mistakes. There was wrongdoing. Whether it was a crime or not, yes, it may have been a crime too. I realized he was at that moment more vulnerable than he'd ever be again. And it was an absolutely emotionally drenching experience because to get Richard Nixon to face up to things like that was more difficult than almost anybody. And then when he did, it had the had all that greater power, you know, because it was this man doing it who wasn't born to do this sort of thing. I let the American people down. And I have to carry that burden with me for the rest of my life. My political life is over. I will never yet, and never again, have an opportunity to serve in any official position. Maybe I can give a little advice from time to time. And so I can only say that in answer to your question, that while technically I did not commit a crime, an impeachable offense, these are legalisms. 
as far as the handling of this matter was concerned, it was so botched up. I made so many bad judgments. The worst ones, mistakes of the heart rather than the head, as I pointed out. But let me say, a man in that top judge, top job, he's got to have a heart. But his head must always rule his heart. So they were a sensational interview, which certainly did wonders for David's career, but actually, I think, humanized Nixon as well. It was watched by 45 million viewers and carried on 150 stations. David later said, we'd won the greatest gamble of our lives. I thought my dad, a great but poor country preacher, must be smiling in heaven. And it was a truly uh, profound piece of television history, and historians will, will be grateful, I think, to David forever. I can't think of another interviewer who could have done that in that way, where, where because he appeared to be empathetic and sympathetic to the person being interviewed, he got Richard Nixon to say things that were obviously true, by the way, but had David gone at him in a sort of heavy way, I doubt he would ever have said. A remarkable story, incredible uh, courage, chutzpah, really. David Frost had risked more than his reputation. To fund the project, he had privately raised two million dollars. He only told me in the last year he had sold his shares in LWT in order to help fund the interviews. If he'd held on to those shares, they would have been worth tens of millions of pounds. Uh, Ray Snoddy called me on the day that the deal was announced when LWT was bought by Granada in those days. And he said, do you realize if you hadn't sold a London weekend shares, you would be collecting a check today for 37 million pounds. Imagine that. Well, I'd rather have done the Nixon interviews. Later, it obviously became the subject of a, of a play and a, and a movie, but uh, very brave of David, very, very brave. Frost Nixon, the dramatization thereof, the play and then the film, it gave him a whole new lease of life. Four, three, two, and... Mr. President, we were talking about the period March 21st to April 30th and the mistakes you made and so on. And I was wondering, would you go further than mistakes, the word that seems not enough for people to understand? Well, what word would you express? David was proud of his portrayal on screen and stage. <laughs> My goodness. David had seen it so many times, he loved it. So I was sitting next to David and he was literally, he was mumbling the lines as they were being said by the, not just his own lines, but all of these lines. And I said, David, shut up. The Nixon interviews made David Frost one of the most famous men in the world. In 1980, using his profile and his considerable business acumen, he led the bid to the Independent Broadcasting Authority for the first commercial breakfast television franchise. They advertised for people to bid for the franchise, and David Frost walks in with all the glitz in the world. And they were barreled you know, knocked down by this, knocked over by this, and gave him the franchise. Uh, well, it's, I think, the happiest day of my life I can recall professionally, you know, because this group came together excited by the, the challenge of breakfast television, and to have the opportunity of doing it as well, well, we, we hope we don't let the side down. In a race to be top dog, the BBC and ITV launched their breakfast shows just weeks apart in 1983. You're watching the first edition of BBC Television's Breakfast Time, Britain's first ever regular early morning television programme. Good morning, welcome to Good Morning Britain for the very first time after months, years of preparation. We have at last what we've always wanted. 
you. Cozy light the BBC program. format was an accessible news magazine, while TV AM's Famous Five took an in-depth approach described as a mission to explain. And we do hope that you're going to stay tuned to us, not just for this morning's programmes, but uh, every morning. Within every three morning. months, it was clear TV AM had been trounced, with ratings as low as 200,000. And it was a disaster. Um, I think it was it failed because I think too much thought had gone into be the presenters and not enough thought had gone into what was in the show. Commander Philpot, we're going to bring order to the weather today, David. Thank you very much indeed. It went wrong because maybe we lacked the kind of drive and expertise to, to stand back from it and, 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 and look at it without the famous five, if you see what I mean. We, it was, it was top-heavy, all the publicity was about us and all that. And in the end, you know, it's about the programmes you make, basically. The people from them are important, but the, it's the content of the programmes. And maybe we didn't get that right, or well, certainly we didn't get something right. TVAM was an incredibly grueling experience. And everyone who, invo was, everyone who was involved with it still bears the scars to a certain extent, some more than others. I remember one moment we were standing outside the, uh, in our office, down in the office next to David on the third floor of this building. There was a canal beneath us and I was standing there looking out the window. I turned around and David was looking at me and he said, who jumps first? <laughs> I think it would have gone together to be about right. But um, it was a solitary lesson. Uh, and, and I think it, it shook up David more than anybody else because it was his baby. Greg Dyke was brought in to turn around the fortunes of TVAM. The new management at TVAM have confirmed that David Frost will not be continuing as one of the main presenters. It's one of a series of changes announced today in an effort to improve poor viewing figures. Well, when I told David that actually we didn't want him to present the show five days a week anymore, he just said, that's fine. Um, I, I'll be able to lay in bed. Rather than lying in bed, David was moved to a new role as host of Frost on Sunday. The winning formula saw David doing what he did best. No, but in Prime, in Prime Minister, you said that in 83, and the but ministers think, knew in November 82. Do you so, think, Mr so you, Frost... That was, that was incorrect, what you, you said. Do you think, to him, wasn't Mr it? Frost, that I spend my days prowling round the pigeonholes of the Ministry of Defence to look at the chart of each and every ship? If you do, you must be bonkers. Frost on Sunday ran until 1992, when TVAM ended. Out of it came an unlikely success story. One of the most extraordinary things about David was his mastery of all genres of television. You know, he was someone who refused to be put in a particular box. As always, we borrowed the keys to two fascinating homes belonging to two well-known personalities. And with the help of Lloyd Grossman, we'll be taking a privileged peep behind closed doors. One thing that carried on through TVAM and was always successful through all the vicissitudes was through the keyhole. As we go through the keyhole. Through the keyhole, he always described it as his hobby. Um, you know, interviewing Prime Minister's presence was his main job, and, and this was just something he adored. He loved it. It was, um, it was, he, it was another way to find out about people, um, and you know, it's great fun to go and watch it. In 1993, David Frost moved to the BBC. Hello, good morning, and welcome to the first edition of Breakfast with Frost. Looking Breakfast with Frost ran every Sunday for over 500 editions, famous for pulling in the big hitters with some help from David's little black book. We were in my grubby little office and TV centre and he dipped into his huge bag, overflowing with different notes and newspapers and bits and pieces, pulled out his black book and said, well, I've got a number here, punched in a number, and ten minutes later my presenter was speaking to the President of the United States and chatting, right, hey, hello, George, yes, David here. And I thought, wow. In a 1998 episode, he secured not one, but two world leaders. Mr Prime Minister, Mr President, uh, it's a great joy to be talking, and let's 
It was all about the Northern Ireland peace process, which was at an absolutely critical stage, and the interview was very important. David, I think, is the only person that could have got the two of us together, and the only person, I think, interviewer that Bill Clinton would have said, yeah, okay, I'm going to do this somewhat unusual thing of being American President, British Prime Minister, actually interviewed together. I think being interviewed by David was rather like relaxing in a warm bath than being conscious there's a cold shower overhead that could be turned on at any moment. It's for him and her to make sure that they get the sort of service that they deserve from the taxes we compulsorily take from them to pay for public service. And do you think some of the criticism of you and the Tory press has been class-based? I've no idea, and if I spent my time worrying about that, I'd be a very miserable man indeed. He was an interviewer to be respectful of and to be very nervous of when you went into to the interview, because although it would be asked in a very nice way, the question would be pretty much on the raw nerve. Do you find President Bush an easy, a, a good person to work with? I mean, do you like him? Do you, do you find him easy to work with? I find him incredibly easy to work with. And I think it's a pity that, that there's such a parody of him uh, in parts of the media here. Do you pray together? Pray together? Hmm. How, how do you mean? Do you say prayers together for peace? You and the President? Well, we don't say prayers together, no, but I'm sure he, in his way, hopes for peace and I hope for peace too. I was literally so surprised by the question, I mean, I hadn't, by the way, but I was so surprised by the question that everyone assumed afterwards that really I had, but hadn't admitted to it. And even now, today, I get asked about, you know, do you kneel and pray with George Bush and so on? And it was just an example of only David would ask such a left field, frankly, odd question such as that. He was prepared to try any technique, really, to get under somebody's skin and into their soul, almost. And you would get the feeling, I would imagine, if you were, I'm not a Catholic, but if you were a Catholic, you go to confession and you speak to the priest, and he's not going to tell anyone. That's what you do for David. He always, you always thought, well, he won't tell anyone this. Did you love, love her? No. I don't think that's what that was about on either side. But I liked her very much. Ladies and gentlemen, David Frost. But what happened when the tables were turned? David Frost, the man who rarely talked about his personal life and never about his politics. What are the areas that, that you care not to be asked about? <laughs> very good question. Isn't that a good question? Can I just make a note of it? <laughs> Well, he, he didn't like being interviewed with David. I, mean, I knew David for, I don't know, 40 years. And I knew him very well. I know some best man at his wedding and all that stuff. And I never really knew an awful lot about the, the young Frost and all that sort of thing. Uh, it wasn't he had anything to hide. It was simply that he believed other people were more interested than he was in that area. Well, I think it's very fortunate for me that I am a genuine independent. I mean, I'm a, I've never bought a party ticket in this country, or been able to buy 100% a party ticket, or in America. You voted, of course. Uh, no, I have never voted. You've never voted. It meant people with wholly different opinions could appear on his program and expect to be given a fair interview that wasn't tilted in any one direction. This is the essential thing about David. He wasn't out to prove any particular political point in an interview. He was there to draw out from the person being interviewed, what they really thought. This private man was married twice. In 1981, he wed Lynn Frederick, who was the widow of Peter Sellers. The couple divorced the following year. A year later, he married the love of his life, Lady Karina Fitzalan Howard, the daughter of the 17th Duke of Norfolk. At the age of 43, he'd found great happiness. The couple's three sons were born within five years. It made for a joyful family life. In terms of, you know, a, a team in, in raising us, um, you know, they, they had everything covered. He wouldn't have had the career he had or been the amazing father he was to us without her love and support along the way. As a father, he couldn't have ever been many more supportive or enthusiastic. There was never a, a bad word said about any of us by him. We used to joke that he just 
couldn't favoritise any one of us on any single topic, <laughs> even whether it was who's the best at sort of being called George or something, he still couldn't, you know. You just got that feeling, which you've always got about them, of, of sort of love and affection in, in the family. And that's in the end what David was about. He was about a lot of things, but he was about his boys. In 2006, he began yet another strand of his career with a new show on Al Jazeera English, where he was to end his days as a broadcaster. Hello, welcome to Frost Over the World, a new programme for a new station. Well, I thought it was an interesting move, actually, because, you know, there was a big TV revolution going on there again. So this was like revolution number four for, for David Frost. Um, Al Jazeera has been quite an extraordinary um, success story. And I think to go and anchor one of its shows was kind of quite a smart move. As he entered his 70s, it might have been time to contemplate a quieter life. Could we tempt you to play us out with a bit of music? I think so, David. Oh, thank God. Praise the Lord. At our um, regular lunches, I would, as friends do, uh, chastise him and say, David, you're going to have to think about um, drawing a, um, a discreet um, and gentle end to your broadcasting career and leading your life in a different way. And he'd, no, 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 no. None of us want to give up. And I, one of the things I said to David recently, you're going to give up. He said, no, are you? No. He, he was never going to retire. As long as there was work to be done, television cameras to appear in front of, he'd have been there. Show me where there's a, a program and I'll be there. I mean... <laughs> On August the 31st, 2013, Sir David Frost died of a heart attack on board the Queen Elizabeth, where he was due to give a speech. He was 74. Sadly, I was on the Solent with my son going back to our place in the Isle of Wight in a boat, and we passed a huge ship, which was uh, the Queen Elizabeth. At the time, I didn't know, obviously, we were just passing in a little boat, and this monstrous great ship was there. At the moment that he, he was clearly uh, breathing his last, which was uh, afterwards, it was, became very poignant. I find it difficult to, to imagine he's dead, you know. That's a strange thing. I'm sitting here talking about my friend who's dead, and I know he's dead, but I can't believe he's dead. It's very odd. It's... Somebody said, Damien Thomas, when she died, oh, she can't have died, she's not the type. And <laughs> I feel the same about, about David. It's odd. I, I was actually due the week after he died, uh, to go and have lunch with him on Sunday in his new house. And uh, I was looking forward to that, when suddenly I turned the television on and he was gone, and I went to his funeral instead, instead of lunch. Sir David Frost, a giant of broadcasting, and above all, a man who loved life and was loved by many. He gave everything he had every day, you know, to making the most of his time, and I think he'd be delighted with that. Well, I think he was on one of the daily um, chat shows a couple of years ago, um, and rather than Sir David Frost and underneath saying, you know, broadcaster or journalist or whatever, it just said the word legend. There's a, there's a massive hole now for us, um, but the fact that there is a hole and that we miss him you know, highlights what an amazing 28 years we were able to have with him before that.